No problem. Hello, everyone, and greetings to my uh, psychology colleagues. I just saw a bunch of their smiling faces on this icy Monday morning. So uh, I noticed you had handouts of my slides, and I admit I'm a continual fiddler. So there is some changes with uh, what you'll see this morning. If you are really a stickler and want them in the correct order, I can email them out. So I have no conflicts to declare. So neurocognitive adaptability. I think the, the simplest explanation to sum up what neurocognitive adaptability is using a little, a little logic phrase like this. Do you remember these logic questions from your, uh, your entrance exams? Neurocognitive adaptability is to within persons as species adaptability is to between persons. And that's really what adaptability is all about. It takes over where natural selection leaves off. So neurocognitive adaptability optimizes individuals in their own lifetimes by extracting information from the world and using it to make local improvements on me. Or as John Horn said, it's a growth of new and better ways of thinking. And uh, we really developed, through natural selection, we developed these variable, um, variable mechanisms. These unpredictable patterns need to be adapted. So we have an incomplete design that we're born with as, as a newborn child, and we have mechanisms to tune ourselves to the circumstances in which we're born. And we recognize this uh, in systematic studies of learning and behavior by, by Skinner, and people as early as, as the, you know, the 1900s, William James, uh, hypothesized that when a person changes their outward behavior, something must be changing internally as well. But it really took until the 1960s, and Marion Diamond was the first person credited with uh, documenting brain changes as a result of environmental exposure. So she looked at very young rats and found that those raised in enriched conditions with toys and stimulation had heavier brains, and uh, they had changes in their uh, enzymatic activity as well. So it took many years before the hypothesis that the brain is plastic and changeable to actually have a concrete um, empirical finding to support it. And now, of course, we know after, after decades of studying the brain that the brain adapts in various different ways. And so I like to think of it, this is the punchline. This is my model of adaptability. It, if you break it down by time scale, it doesn't seem like multiple different mechanisms anymore. If you think about the brain and the person as adapting to things uh, that change at the decade or the year level, at the month or the day level, the minute second level, the sub-second level, we have different brain functions and mechanisms that change at these time intervals. And these allow us to demonstrate behavior that's flexible and plastic at various different intervals of time. So my working definition for neurocognitive adaptability is it's uh, made up of mechanisms fostered through natural selection to accommodate environmental demands that change with a periodicity of less than one lifetime. And so we can think about different timescales in this way as well. This is a model from Loveden and his colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And they talked about the fact that um, there's this changing demand on our brain's adaptability. So this is the gray line. And our black line is kind of where we're at, level-wise. And so we have a certain functional range, and some ups and downs don't bother us too much. But when we get a new job, suddenly there's, there's this protracted mismatch, and we're not making the mark. So slower changing mechanisms like dendrite growth, or uh, cell, even cell death, or cell, new cell birth starts to occur over the period of days and weeks. And suddenly we have this new optimal line, and we're adapted to this new job. So the ups and downs are just ups and downs again. There's no more protracted mismatch. And on a longer time interval, if we consider this on a lifetime scale, this is the model that Cattell and Horn came up with. They had a model of fluid and crystallized intelligence. Early in life, we have no crystallized intelligence. It's all culture-based, and so it takes time for us to, to gain that knowledge. With our flexible uh, fluid knowledge, things like executive function, shifting our attention, um, over time we build up a store of vocabulary, of cultural knowledge that's crystallized literally in our brain's structure. And so when we look at a lifetime scale, here's some data from the end of the lifespan, 75 to 95 year olds. These are various neuropsychological tasks. The dotted lines show sort of a healthy aging trajectory. And you can see, contrary to popular belief, a lot of healthy people actually improve in their cognitive function late in life. 
But those that go on to have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment start to show this changing slope and a rapid decline. So at the, year, at the scale of years, on the lifetime scale, we can show changes in cognition. Uh, but of course, just to remind us, I've shown some EEG waves here. These are electrical waves recorded from the brain scalp. These changes occur at the millisecond scale. So although we're showing 20 years of cognitive data here, there's millions and millions and billions and trillions of cognitive operations that occur between each of these data points. So the brain really operates like a series of nesting Russian dolls. We have tiny, tiny milli picosecond processes that fluctuate uh, at an imperceptible rate to humans, and all the way up here we have, you know, the birth and death of individuals. And all these different timescales are represented within me and within you. But the brain definitely does change with age. We definitely do lose brain volume as we age. And, uh, but the take home point is that there's a lot of scatter. You can see all the different uh, data points here around the regression lines. The other thing is the different sections of our brain age in different ways. So they show different patterns of decline. Primary visual cortex doesn't actually show a lot of change. The lateral prefrontal cortex, which we use to th uh, do things like executive functions, uh, attention switching and that, does decline in kind of a linear way. Hippocampal function actually dec declines quite rapidly in an accelerating curve. But there's a lot of individual scatter. Similarly, we can measure changes in cognitive function over time. Again, this is really nice longitudinal data from the Seattle Longitudinal Study. And they're showing all these different cognitive domains age in their own ways. And so it looks a little bit like a mishmash, but I'll draw your, your attention just to the two ends of the lifespan. So in, uh, in psychology, we're really good at developing new tests. And we often develop them using uh, free or very cheap volunteers that are everywhere, and they happen to be called undergraduate students. And so we get very excited about these new tests that tend to measure things like perceptual speed, uh, flexibility, reasoning. These are the strengths of the 25-year-old. Uh, there are weaknesses in, the, in an older person. So speed is not the strength of, a, of an 80-year-old. But look at what's the weakness. The weakest point of a 25-year-old is verbal ability. What's the strength of the 80-year-old? Oh, verbal ability. So is it really that different? Or is it really worse or better? Is it, is it a difference, right? Different skill sets. So fluid ability, crystallized ability. And at some point, there's some shift in the ordering of cognitive processes, if you will. So aging is sort of like uh, an adaptive process in that we use our flexibility to adapt crystallized cultural reliable knowledge. Uh, but it also represents a loss of adaptability. So we adapt with age, but we lose the ability to adapt. We become better adapted, but less able to adapt. Now you might be wondering what this has to do with uh, the hospital, because it sounds maybe too theoretical for you. I can assure you that adaptability is a lot, uh, has a lot to do with how we identify problems. When people come to see us, they're often distressed. They feel like something isn't right. Uh, they're not doing as much as they used to. They're not achieving what they used to. Or other people are noticing that they're falling short. So in some way, it's a mismatch between that person and their environment. Um, and we also know that adaptability mechanisms differ in quantity and quality across the lifespan and in health and disease. So a lot of the mechanisms that a healthy person has that allow them to adapt and flex are the things that get impaired when you have a, a dementia pathology setting in. So a multi-mechanism perspective on adaptability can improve clinical care. We can, co we can consider things like which, which mechanisms are preserved and lost, and those might describe our diagnoses. We can also consider which mechanisms can be fostered, which can highlight certain treatment opportunities. So to kind of to sum up where we've been so far, adaptability is an, accommodates environmental demands that change with periodicities of less than a lifetime. Aging is an expected change over time in the blend of neurocognitive strengths and weaknesses. And this biology is shaped by the environment from day one. Now, dementia is a syndrome of impairment beyond normal aging that leads to functional impairment. And functional impairment is what? A failure to meet the demands of the environment, right? So we can prevent functional impairment by changing the environment, or we can prevent functional impairment by changing the individual. But the sad truth is that by the time we've diagnosed someone with dementia, it's too late. The brain has changed too much, and the person has declined to the point where they're not able to care for themselves. That is the definition of dementia. So hence all the, the interest in preventative treatments of dementia. But it's, when someone has dementia, it's too late to prevent dementia, as silly as it sounds to say that out loud. 
Luckily, we have new models emerging. So up until very recently, we had this model that Alzheimer's disease or various dementias start with, with clinical symptoms. So there's these brain changes that nobody can detect that must precede the cognitive symptoms when the person sort of comes to the clinic. And then there's very little we can do before the dementia diagnosis occurs, the functional impairment arises. Well, now we know that there are brain changes that we can detect. So we can start prevention even before we detect changes in brain. And certainly, once we detect a sign of dementia, we can start secondary prevention efforts that are targeted to that particular dementia. So I'll be talking a little bit about the more primary prevention stuff later, the stuff we can all do to prevent us from getting to that stage. So here's my sort of working premise, getting into the meat of things. Losses in ecological adaptability, my ability to adapt in my daily life, is preceded by a loss in my brain's ability to adapt, and my brain shows up as a neural and a cognitive thing, depending on how I look at it. But those changes in my brain and my thinking precede the changes in my day-to-day -day function, and that is, not a, that is not a point to debate. There are some barriers to detecting very early dementia, though, and very early pathological aging. That is, between-person variability is extreme, driven by genetics, education, and other things. There's a very wide range in what's normal and what's pathological. It really depends on who you are and what you've been through and where you're from. There's also a lot of within-person variability. So I can measure an older person today, and I can measure them a week from today, and they might perform very differently. So what does that mean? Are they normal or are they not? And these, this variability is not error, it's not error, it's not noise, it's meaningful. It's driven by physiological fluctuations, changes in environmental demand, changes in anxiety and familiarity with tests, you name it. So people show these complex patterns of change and fluctuation across hierarchically nested timescales. Remember the Russian dolls, right? It's all nested, one in the other. So, uh, one of the best ways to capture the brain's resting adaptability is to measure it with electrodes. So I've, I've taken the opportunity to introduce you to a, a newfangled EEG device here. This is me wearing the latest in EEG technology, which is this little headband. That's the whole EEG. It's just a headband, no wires or anything. And it runs on a tablet computer. So when I started EEG research 12 years ago, I ran a paper chart with pens and I had to wear a lab coat because ink was flying everywhere. Uh, so things have changed drastically. So the data I'm going to show today wasn't done using this mobile system, but it, this is just to highlight the fact that um, the real barrier to collecting something like EEG data in a visit it is a matter of two or three hundred dollars to buy one of these headbands uh, and two or three minutes of the person sitting with their eyes closed to record their resting brain activity. Um, oops. And I've used resting recordings in particular because uh, you, can, you can record EEG data while someone's doing a cognitive task for sure, but that really um, depends on them being able to do the task, being able to pay attention to it. So I wanted to use a measure that could be used by anyone in any stage of disease and uh, any cultural linguistic background. And the best way to extract adaptability data from the EEG is this measure called entropy. So here's kind of an example EEG wave. It's super noisy. And then a nice smooth sine wave. So this wave here has a lot more entropy. Irregularity, complexity, dissimilarity, variability. The brain has a lot of variability in it. It's not a nice smooth wave. And this, this algorithm works through pattern recognition, which we don't need to spend much time on today. But one key thing to know is that we can take an EEG signal and do what's called coarse graining to it. So we can extract multiple time scales from one EEG wave. So first we take the raw wave, which is our scale one. Then we average together every second adjacent data point to get scale factor two. Then every third data point for three, all the way up to 10, 20, 30 data points. So you can see the line gets smoother and smoother and smoother and less complex. So this, this tells us that there's different types of information embedded in the brain's activity at different time scales. And we can look at these all simultaneously. So right here at the bottom, here is an EEG wave, and here is the multiple scale entropy curve. So this is time scale, and this is the amount of entropy. So you can see at very brief time scales, very fast fluctuations of brain, there's not a lot of entropy, not a lot of information or data there. But as we get to longer intervals, a few milliseconds, 10, 20, 30 milliseconds, there's a lot more information content in the brain. And you can see when we look at different types of noise and signals in nature, all of them show this decreasing entropy with time scale. 
the EEG, the brain, is the only structure in nature that shows increasing entropy at longer time scales. Because the brain remembers, the brain has memory, memory of a millisecond, memory of a second, memory of a day, a year, a month. The brain has self-similar repeating patterns. It's not noise, like white noise. You can see it has a very different profile. When we look at multi-scale EEG entropy across the lifespan, so here's some data from uh, eight-year-olds all the way up to adults, you can see here's the entropy across time scale for the youngest group, and it gets higher and higher and higher and higher across age. So as our brain goes from a pile of goo, and I go from a pile of goo, to a walking, talking, functional human, my brain becomes more complex, and it contains more information. Now. This trend continues, you might be surprised to know. The trend in increasing entropy across the lifespan into adulthood continues from young, middle to older adulthood. So my brain's entropy increases as I age, full stop. When we, have, when we look at dementia now, here we have normal people and people with MCI. Dementia actually leads to this reduction in brain entropy. You can see that here. So young, middle, older adulthoods, this increase, and then normal MCI dementia. So we have a real developmental progression and gain in entropy that gets lost in dementia, but it's not lost in healthy aging. Now, you may have noticed I've cut this graph off, and that's because a lot of people up until the last couple of years only looked at sort of zero to 20 millisecond scales in the brain, and they found pretty consistent results. This group of Randy McIntoshes from the Rotman Institute decided to look a little further out, and lo and behold, they found that at longer time intervals, older people did actually lose in entropy relative to younger adults. So there's actually a time scale specific uh, mechanism going on here. That's why I have the purple and the green bars. So at low, uh, fine time scales, people that are younger are lower in entropy, but at longer time scales, people that are younger are higher in entropy. So it's not a, it's not a very straightforward phenomenon. It's multiple mechanisms that are expressed as adaptability across time scale. So of course you're probably wondering, if you're like me, there must be a stage before mild cognitive impairment, right? If, if there's a dementia and there's a normal and there's a stage called mild cognitive impairment between them, there must be something before normal or before MCI and after normal. And indeed there is a pre-MCI stage. And recently this, this stage was described by uh, Emily bon uh, Edmonds and Bondi. And they actually pr propose these criteria for a stage they call subtle cognitive decline, or SCD. And this, this is a, a, a set of criteria that uses neuropsychological test data, so cognitive tests with very liberal cut scores. So they use impaired range scores of only one or more standard deviations below, which is very, uh, very sensitive. Some people will use two, and it's a very conservative cutoff. But they want to catch subtle decline. So they test people with neuropsych measures and counted up the numbers of impaired scores to di diagnose them as normal, subtle decline, or MCI, based on more and more uh, impairment. But they identified a shortcoming to their own criteria, and they said, our criteria are too strict to capture individuals with, uh, to capture all individuals with very early changes. Those who have declined cognitively but are still in the normal range will not be detected. Well, luckily there's a way to deal with that, too. This woman, Doreen Rents, came up with a brilliant um, methodology where you can actually correct people's uh, performances for their educational background. And what she found, here we have uh, neuropsychological performance on the y-axis, and here we have uh, Pittsburgh compound B binding. So PIB is a compound that binds amyloid plaques in the brain. It's a, a marker of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see, in general, as neuropsych uh, performance decreases, the amount of amyloid increases. So we have this negative relationship. But these red, the red line is people who are higher in education, higher in pre-morbid function, or reserve, we call cognitive reserve. They've built up this store through their experiences. They, they're less uh, susceptible to the effects of amyloid. So their cognition is buffered against disease burden. So by building up your brain's adaptability, it becomes more able to adapt to disease later in life. 
So this, this can actually help to increase the sensitivity of our neuropsych tests. If people that are performing well and then decline are still in the, in the normal range, they're going to get classified as normal. But if we adjust for their education, their pre-morbid function, we can start to detect even high-functioning people who are starting to decline. Because they're declining relative to themselves, and that's the real important indicator. So I had a group of participants from uh, Victoria, BC, uh, some 44 years old, 71 years of age on average. These were not normal people. These are Victoria older adults. And if you've ever been to Victoria, BC, you'll know that it's kind of like the uh, retirement mecca of Canada. So my seven-year-olds biked into the lab every day and uh, probably were in better shape than me often. And you can see their average education was 17 years. So that means the average participant in my study had 12 years of high school, plus four years of uh, university, plus another year and a half. So they had more than a bachelor's degree on average. A lot of them had PhDs, a lot of them were former faculty. So these are not the typical older adults. An estimate of their pre-morbid function, which is a very crude estimate of their IQ, the top, using an irregular word reading score, their average was 118, which is more than a standard deviation above normal. So this is not a normal sample, but it is a great sample to apply um, Doreen Rentz's education correction. These are the people that Bondi and Edmonds were talking about that wouldn't be captured by their criteria. So uh, we don't have to dwell on that. When I diagnosed these people for, for risk based on the standard neuropsych criteria and grouped them into normal um, subtle decline or MCI, so here's MCI, the blue line, subtle decline was the green line, and uh, normal is the red line. These are their brain, resting brain entropy curves. You can see that much like in dementia, we have the normal healthy people, the maybe slightly at risk people a little lower, and then the MCI people even lower still. So even in these high performing people that did not meet any criteria for MCI or dementia, when we applied extremely strict criteria and adjusted them for their high standards, we were able to detect subtle differences in their brain. And you can see again, they are time scale specific. So the, the subtle decline group is lower than the normal group only at this short time scale. At longer time scales, it was no different. So it does call back the Macintosh results in that older, normal, normal older brain function does show an increased entropy at short time scales that is lost, even in subtle decline, MCI, and dementia. But we do have this preservation of long time scale adaptability. I don't know what that means yet, to be honest. Macintosh thinks it might reflect a difference in very local brain areas that are close to each other interacting as opposed to more distant. We know with aging that distant interactions become uh, less important and it's more about local processing. That might explain why people become more uh, themselves as they get older. Everyone gets more individualized and less like each other. That's just uh, a conjecture though. But what we do know is that adjusting, adjusting people's cognition for their own reserve, their own pre-morbid, their own education level, can increase the sensitivity to detecting early declines, uh, especially among high-functioning people. And now we know that that relationship of EEG uh, entropy holds even in the very subtly impaired groups of people. So that's at the very, very rapid time scale, the millisecond time scale. I'm just recalling our table of time scales here. Any questions so far? Is anyone totally lost? I know it's Monday morning and it's an ice storm, but I thought you could all handle this. So at slightly faster time scales, above the millisecond time scale, more up to the second time scale, cognition and performance and behavior also shows uh, very fast oscillations. So these are, these are response times to a cognitive task. So this is somebody sitting in front of a computer, getting flashed number letter stimuli and having to push buttons to re in response to what they see. And you can see these large fluctuations in their response time, which are not random. They are meaningful fluctuations. And normal healthy people actually show this pink noise profile that you can actually measure with a, a, uh, this coefficient called alpha, which I won't get into. But when alpha approaches one, uh, like, we do, like we see here, this is a nice, nice healthy reaction time series. When people around, uh, when pe family members and friends that know an individual start to rate their cognition as declining, their, their behavior starts to look more white noise-like, pure randomness. And so this alpha moves away from one towards a value of 0.5, and we have truly random cognitive and behavioral noise. So healthy cognition is not random and meaningless. It's, it's variable, but it's meaningful variation. 
So that's at the second time scale. Jumping up to the day and week time scale, our brains and our bodies again show these remarkable abilities to adapt. So at the week and day time scale, we have this thing called retest learning or practice effects. If you've ever learned to do anything like a musical instrument or a new routine and saw yourself go from unable to do it to faking it to not thinking about it while you're doing it, you've learned something. And this takes days and weeks to emerge. And we know even in cognition, when we give people repeated cognitive tests, even at, the, even at six or seven year intervals, people show practice gains in cognitive measures. So we are very good at learning. And this is a very basic form of neuroplasticity, a directly observable change in uh, brain function. And it's not a nuisance. It, up until now, it's been called uh, a nuisance. We have to correct for practice effects so we can de detect true change. If I measure a person now and two years from now, I want to know, have they declined? But if they've learned from practice, they might actually look they, like they've improved. So I have to control that practice effect to detect my decline. But practice effects are more than just a nuisance that we need to control for. They're actually an adaptability metric. And now we know through work of Duff, Kevin Duff and others, that people who are younger can learn more than people who are older. Not a surprise. We also know that people who, are, who have early dementia have impaired learning. It's one of the first indicators, is they're not going to learn as much from trial to trial on a cognitive task. Uh, task. Um, and practice effects are correlated with brain metabolism in people with mild cognitive impairment. So if you have lower brain metabolism, you learn less. And this, so this is a source of nuisance and uh, uh, error to clinicians that we don't currently harvest. Um, but I decided to take a look at it, again, uh, using a time metric that was suitable to the mechanism I was trying to study. So I had these people bike into my lab four to six times in about a month and complete a battery of computerized cognitive tasks to show, oops, the show must go on, to show that they could learn in their, in their performances. So, um, so I had them do this computerized switching task, which again, they had to sit in front of a computer and see numbers and letters flash and push one of two buttons to classify the stimulus that they saw. And basically, some of, the tr some of the trials, the rules for classification stayed the same, and some of the trials, the rules for classification changed. And when the rules for classification change right before someone sees a stimulus, they're slowed down in their performance, and that's what we call the, uh, the switch cost. So you'll see that in a moment while I walk you through our, our figure. In order to highlight differences in learning across trials, I used, again, this measure of reserve or premorbid function, the irregular word list. And I also used a personality metric, uh, a dimension called conscientiousness, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. But these are cross-sectional markers of adaptability, both linked to longevity and academic achievement. Now I'm going to walk us through this figure nice and slow, so don't get overwhelmed. So the panels at the top here are days of testing. So each person came in for six occasions. Now here we have response speed on the y-axis. So faster, higher is faster speed, faster performance. And so I've adjusted their speed for their accuracy. So this is just a pure measure of performance. Higher is better. Now on these edges of each panel, we have the stay trials where the rule stayed the same and the switch trial where the rule changed. And so you can see the downward slope overall, is, that's the switch cost. When things shift, we have to shift our thinking before we reply, and it slows us down by about a quarter of a second. It's not insignificant. So now what do we see across days? So looking across days, just at the stay trials, I'll try to draw this line, you can see that people learn on just the stay trials. Just the switch trials, same thing, people learn and get faster across days. But the real beauty of this study is in the, the, the things that moderate the learning. So look first uh, over here, dotted line means someone high in reserve, high in education, high in premorbid function, solid lines are low, and then conscientiousness, low is red and high is blue. So at time one, we see the dotted lines kind of cluster together and the solid lines kind of cluster together. 
Uh, and sure enough, the big difference wasn't due to conscientiousness, it was due at baseline to differences in reserve. And this is a well-known effect in the literature. When people come for their first assessment, people who have more educational background do better on testing, period. Doesn't matter about ability. So in the US, there's a lot of uh, consternation because certain ethnic groups, black people, Hispanic people, tend to get worse education. And so you have whole groups of people who can be visibly identified, who perform worse on tests, but it's not because of the color of their skin. The color of their skin has impacted their schooling, and their schooling has impacted their performance on the test. So when you bring them back a second time, they show this huge gain, and uh, that's more like their, their actual level. So this is a real effect that we are replicating. So at the first occasion, differences in education are really predictive of difference in switch cost. But now look across days. So we have the dotted lines and the solid lines hanging out together, but then they do start to migrate, and suddenly the dotted lines and solid lines are separate, uh, or sorry, are, uh, are not, no longer together. We have a separation based on red and green, on conscientiousness. So although at baseline education matters a lot, uh, in terms of predicting who's going to improve more with practice, people who are higher in conscientiousness end up improving more than people who are lower in conscientiousness. So you might be wondering now what the heck conscientiousness is and how do I get some of that stuff? Well, you can get it, ironically. You, you can sort of practice conscientious habits, which is why I sort of highlighted them here. But conscientiousness is a, a dimension of a five-factor personality theory that is uh, well established in the literature. You measure it with a few self-report questions, and you get an idea of how competent, orderly, dutiful, et cetera, somebody is. And sure enough, this predicts a lot of things about job success and achievement in school. It also predicts how well you improve on a cognitive task. Now, more interestingly for our point of view, conscientiousness is related to the size and shape and function of my prefrontal structures. Um, it has an inverse correlation with executive function declines. People who report declining attention and declining uh, working memory show uh, lower conscientiousness. More, more excitingly even, people who are higher in conscientiousness are less susceptible to cognitive decline as a result of things like amyloid burden for Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia from uh, Lewy bodies. So here's an example of that finding from Wilson. So here we have people with no Lewy body dementia in terms of global cognition. So no Lewy body. And then all of these groups have Lewy body dementia. This group has high education, middle education, low education. So education and pre-morbid experiences really are a buffer against disease-related cognitive decline. But ironically, conscientious itself is not stable. So there, there was this saying forever in psychology that personality is hard like plaster. You develop it through childhood and at 20 you have a personality and then it's hard like plaster. It doesn't change. Well that's not true. It actually changes quite a bit as you can see from this figure. And here are all the dimensions of personality. Agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, openness. They all change with age. So this group, I love their, their finding. Substantial non-linear age effects led to the rejection of the plaster hypothesis. So for older age, they said, it's more like a la dolce vita effect of old age. In later years, people become happier, more content and less, uh, more, con more self-content and self-centered, more laid back and satisfied with what they have, less preoccupied with productivity. That starts to sound a bit like adaptation too, doesn't it? So adaptation happens at all different time scales. The, the take home point of this second little study is that reserve reflected differences in baseline performance, that first occasion. Education, pre-morbid function, reserve affect how we perform a test the first time we see it. And this relates to things like test wiseness. How familiar are people with testing? Um, and it might reflect immediate adaptation differences because it happens at that one occasion. In contrast, conscientiousness is individual differences in slope of learning across trials. Now, unfortunately, there's other confounds that can affect learning, such as sleep, stress, episodic memory, intervening interference. But uh, that's something to consider on the individual case level. So here we are, a bit of a whirlwind tour. But back to this idea of adaptability as something that occurs across different time scales. So the brain, I think, I hope you're all getting this, that the brain exhibits different metrics uh, different mechanisms, excuse me, of adaptability that are expressed at different time scales, which make them accessible through different metrics, different paradigms, if you want to measure them. So there's different measures for different levels of variation across the within-person spectrum. So I've kind of created a, a little time ruler here. So don't get scared if you're afraid of scientific notation, but these are powers of 10. 
Um, so our brain operates from like 10 to the negative four seconds, like the microsecond scale or even lower, all the way up to the gigasecond scale. So we each get about one gigasecond on this earth. That's one lifetime. So don't mess around with your gig. You only get one. Um, but again, all of these physiological changes are expressed at different time scales. And all of these behavioral changes are expressed at different time scales. And we use different measures to access those. And we've zoomed in on a few of them today. So I showed you at the sub-second scale, brain entropy. A little higher up, I showed you second-to-second -second variance in pushing a button in response to a cognitive test. Uh, a little bit further up at the day-to-week scale, I showed you learning at the scale of about a, a month. And you know, in the, in the clinic, when we see people over years repeatedly, we, we can see observed, we can observe changes, declines in their performance. We can observe that they don't improve as much as we'd expect based on uh, practice literature. But we might even see within one assessment differences across this continuum. So when I assess people for their neuropsychological functioning, I consider all these different types of measures. And you can classify them according to domain, like attention, memory, language, uh, problem solving. Or you can also uh, classify them according to the time scale at which they're expressed. So when I'm looking at someone's rhythmic tapping and how coordinated they are, I'm looking at regulating their, their output at less than a second. Um, when I'm looking at how well they can think and quickly respond in a controlled way, it's about a second. Um, we have sensory impressions that last for a, f a few seconds that we can use to make decisions and then they fade away. We can hold things in working memory for several seconds without rehearsal before they fade. Immediate recall lasts several minutes without much effort. Delayed recall with a little bit of practice. Delayed recall can, can last for, for 30 minutes. You probably can still remember my name even though it's been over 30 minutes. We don't do a great job at this immediate, uh, intermediate and long delay recall because people are only in the clinic for one day. We don't get to see them after a sleep or two, after repeated practice. You need sleep for certain of these mechanisms to work, like memory consolidation, takes sleep uh, to occur. But we do even assess things like vocabulary, uh, information, cultural knowledge, and that stuff is built up over years and decades. So I think we do an okay job. I think computerized assessments could fill this gap quite nicely. So this really, uh, may, you, might be starting, you might be starting to wonder, how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we adapt these two views together? Aging as adaptability, aging as decline. Um, adaptability always allows optimization, but some people lose certain types of adaptability. How do we start to understand the different mechanisms in a meaningful, in a meaningful way? Uh, I stole an idea from a, a guy named Godfrey Smith for his Darwinian spaces, and I created this little adaptability cube. So you can think of adaptability mechanisms as having maybe these three dimensions. How persistent are they? In that, are they reversible when they occur? You know, is it like Velcro on and off, or is it like uh, crazy glue? Right, once it's on, it's not coming off. So crazy glue would be up here, Velcro down here. How fast does it occur, the speed? And what's the range, you know? I can adapt really quickly to very small changes, but if the climate suddenly changed, it would take me a few years, possibly some generations of my family before we really adapted to the climate, right? So what's the functional range of those change, changes? And from some people's perspective, you can call these rapid, transient, limited magnitude changes more flexible changes. I'm flexible here in the moment. And the more persistent, slower, wider available functional range changes are more of the plastic, that neuroplasticity stuff that takes days and weeks and months to occur. So from, from the little uh, studies I presented, you might think of EEG entropy as maybe a flexible metric, conscientiousness as more of a plastic metric. But to be honest, I don't even know what the right dimensions of my cube are, so don't, don't take this to the bank just yet. I would like to spend just the last couple of minutes here of talking a bit about what this means for how we see aging and how we help people who are aging. So again, younger people, we can maybe see them as adaptable. Older people as adapted. Less adaptable, more adapted. Less adapted, more adaptable. How does this feed into our conceptions of aging? Well, John Horn said, there may be no aging decline and no rise, but a shift in proportion of abilities. He said, there's a growth of new and better ways of thinking. And he's right, we really do get better adapted to our environment the older we get. And I, I'm gonna, I know this is a lot of text, but I just love this analysis from, from Lashley in 1930. So Lashley, Carl Lashley, would damage rats 
brains in different ways and watch them run down the maze. And he, after years of doing this, and thousands of rats, he said, if we train an animal in a maze and observe carefully his subsequent errorless learning, we find little identity of movement in su successive trials. He gallops through in one, he, in another he shuffles along, sniffing at the cover of the box. If we injure his cerebellum, he may roll through the maze. He follows the correct path with every variety of twist and posture, so we cannot identify a single movement as characteristic of the habit. There always seems to be an adaptive reorganization. And to me, this, this to me spoke to what dementia is all about. The older people I've met who are educated and motivated, they would roll down the maze. I had a, a patient in rehab a little while ago, educated man in his 70s who had a cerebellar injury, previously very active, and we were talking about sending him home in a wheelchair. He had this huge property of uneven ground, wheelchair wouldn't work, walker wouldn't work, and the team said, well, how are you gonna walk around outside? And he said, I'll crawl. And we, th we were shocked and horrified. He was a rat rolling through that maze. He was not willing to give up that functional goal. And he was going to do it no matter what it took. So we do have these two versions of aging, right? The decline, disease, dependence, dead and dying view. And this idea that older people are wise, stoic, altruistic, and strategic. So how do we rectify these? Wisdom really is greater in the, in, in the older population. If we develop tasks, like this group did, if we develop a task focused on defining the strengths of an older person, like I said at the start, a lot of our tasks are developed by default on 20-year-olds. And so whatever they do well, we, we create tasks to measure. When this group looked at a group of older people, they designed a wisdom task and found that, lo and behold, older people were wiser than young people. So when, when a decision does not require speed or constant flexibility, but experience, when you ask them questions about uh, wars, social conflict, uh, change, family dynamics, older people make better judgments. And as a group, older people are more cognitively diverse, meaning that they're more individualized, they're more adapted to their unique environment. So this is just a, me a measure of scatter within groups. So young people have almost no scatter. They're all kind of the same. Older people have different strengths and weaknesses. They've all led different lives. So I like this analogy of tea leaves. Here's a field of uh, green, flexible, young tea leaves, highly adaptable, indistinguishable, right? But we can take each of these leaves, treat it in a different way, age it, ferment it, and we end up with all these different varieties of tea, right? So unique lives create uniquely adapted brains in the same way that unique environments create uniquely uh, adapted tea leaves. So if society were a pot of tea, the elders would be the tea leaves. The youth would be the hot water with their speed and efficiency. Elders would have their wisdom and their rich experience. And when you combine the two, you get a pot of tea. And that's probably better for everybody. And there are some empirical benefits to what I call brewing tea. So one particular study in the US took at-risk older people and paired them with kindergarten to grade three classrooms. Uh, for 15 hours a week per, for six months, this older person would spend time in the classroom supporting the kids in their academics, helping them with their homework and whatnot. These older people got more physical activity, they got more cognitive activity, they got more social activity. Their memory improved at the end of the study, their executive function improved at the end of the study, and actually their brain metabolism and their prefrontal brain metabolism actually increased just as a result of hanging out with some young people. I can't think of an easier intervention. And there are a number of others, which uh, these days, none of this is gonna be, a lot of this isn't gonna be news to anybody. You know, We're born with our genetics, but even that is seemingly not uh, the case anymore. We're, we're now changing genetics, so maybe this is no longer such a hard limit. Our early environment and education is a huge predictor of how we do in late life. And then there's our ongoing lifestyle, diet, sleep, exercise, etc., cognitive stimulation, social support, engagement, all these things we know prevent decline from age and prevent decline from disease. There's another type of factors that we don't like to talk about much. Luckily, you call the psychologist in, so I'm trained to handle this. Things like, what happens when I, when I make an error? You know, I'm, I, got a, I get an email from the, uh, the government saying that I'm almost ready to retire, and that morning I forget my car keys. What might I think? Oh, here we go, right? That phrase, senior moment, or whatever pops in. That phrase, senior moment, really hides a deep-seated fear and anxiety that we all have. The more educated we are, really, the more susceptible we are to self-diagnosing. You know, we all make cognitive slip-ups, but when I say senior moment, I'm, to, I'm saying to myself, I hope I don't have Alzheimer's disease. So that's really not a helpful thing to say to ourselves. In fact, by thinking that, 
we make our attentional lapses that we all have, we make them more salient, we make them more noticeable. And when they're more noticeable, they draw our attention, we get upset and we have a reaction to them, which feeds into this distraction. So you get into this loop. Every time you make an attentional lapse and react to it, it becomes a loop. And we know from uh, some, study in, some studies in Europe that people higher in education, here's the high reserve and the low reserve group over time, when the first little blip of cognitive change happens, people low in reserve don't really show any difference. People higher in reserve, when they have a little blip of cognitive decline, suddenly they get depressed, they get anxious, they get fearful, they start reporting cognitive symptoms, and it leads to a sort of a, a spiral for a lot of people if you're susceptible to mood uh, problems. So some studies I was involved with a couple of years ago, and then we'll wrap up, looked at moderating some of these existential emotional factors through mindfulness training. And what we found was compared to a psychoeducation group, a group where people were learning about aging and learning strategies, adding mindfulness, relaxation and attention control, and reducing self-judgment, we actually increased people's brain volume, believe it or not. We improved their attention through this, this attentional component called P3, improved their monitoring of their cognition through another uh, EEG component called the ERN, which I don't have time to get into. Um, we reduced their anxiety about aging. We reduced their cognitive self-judgments. Both uh, interventions, the mindfulness and the education, reduced cognitive complaints and increased self-efficacy in cognition, meaning people felt like they knew how to manage any memory issue that they might have. So in summary, adaptability is multi-mechanistic. Mechanism-specific changes result in patterns of adaptability, uh, preservation, and loss in healthy and pathological aging. Very subtle performance declines are associated with timescale-specific losses in the very briefest timescales of brain adaptability. Population-wide screening for early dementia could use self-report, computerized, and resting EEG measures very easily without much burden. Uh, they require further validation, of course. But another point to ponder, prevention and intervention starts with acknowledgement that aging as decline is unhelpful and overly simplistic. So thank you for uh, paying attention and coming in today, and thank you all those watching uh, at the other sites. I'll take some questions now.